Joshua 14 and 12, the Bible says that Caleb looked out at the land of inheritance and he said, give me this mountain. There are times when mountains look insurpassable with man, but all things are possible with God. This morning, I want to talk about the third of those mountains that seems impossible with man, but very possible with God. Very grateful for your presence. We've been looking at church problems. It's not, a, it's not an exciting topic. No one wants church problems, but every church must acknowledge that church problems are possible. And when they arrive, we need to have a biblical approach. So when mountains won't move, what do you do? You go to the Word of God. Take your Bibles to Acts, the 15th chapter, and we're going to look at the third of the three problems, personal problems. Friends, everyone has personal problems. No one is exempt from that this morning. Every person that's living this morning within the age of accountability has experienced a personal problem. You're experiencing them now, or you're going to experience them in the future. Now we've noticed in our study thus far that these problems can be looked at in these particular ways. In Acts chapter 6, the church experienced practical problems. Here the Grecian widows were being neglected and there arose a disturbance among the brethren. How are we going to handle that? We noticed the following points. Number one, that they criticized. Number two, then after the criticism, they prioritized how are we going to take care of this matter? Then number three, they organized, that is, they got the brethren organized so that this particular criticism could be addressed. Then we noticed they evangelized. They didn't stop the work of the gospel. That was a practical problem. We saw it in Acts chapter 6. It was dealt with forthrightly. Then we noticed last Sunday that uh, there was another set of problems. And the problem were principal problems, problems dealing with doctrine. These are problems that arise when people are not faithful to the Word of God. As review, this dealt with circumcision. There were those who had been uh, baptized, those who had become Christians, members of the church, Jews, who were unwilling to leave off some of the Jewish doctrine. Circumcision, they wanted to bind it upon the Gentile brethren. Here's what we noticed. First of all, when this particular doctrine was promoted, the apostles immediately defied it. False doctrine needs to be defied. Then they brought it before the brethren and they had a debate about it. They asked, what does God's word say? And so they declared everything that God had said regarding this particular issue. Then they decided to dismiss it. It was dealt with. Now we can dismiss the doctrine because we know that God's word does not allow for it. And then of course, we understand the principle. Number one, in the practical problems, uh, the principal problems, number two, to know the book. And the practical problems, to know your place. Those are the two chief lessons, know your place. Number two, know the book. But what about personal problems? At the end of Acts chapter 15, we have a, a personal issue. The issue deals with an inspired apostle, Paul. And even inspired apostles, it doesn't mean that they were infallible. Here we find there is a sharp dissension that occurred. Brethren who couldn't get along. So how does the scripture portray this particular issue? Number one, let's look at the duty. Because there's a duty here that's given. And some days after Paul, this is after they had solved the problem of the circumcision, the false teachers, Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And so we see that there's going to be an issue that's going to come before Paul and Barnabas that they have no knowledge of. Everything is peaceful. But we know in the coming verse there's going to be an issue that comes. Paul wants to continue in the duty of the church. Friends, anytime we do the work of God, there is going to be issues. There are going to be problems. In fact, one author says to live with saints above will be eternal glory. But to live with saints below, now that's another story. Sometimes brethren just don't get along. Everything was going well. They couldn't see an issue. I know, no doubt Paul, when he went to Barnabas, did not foresee the dissension that was going to take place. Problems arise when we least expect them. We're just doing our duty. 
We're trying to be a good Bible class teacher. We're, 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 trying, to, we're trying to do the work of benevolence. And we don't anticipate there'll be a problem. I just want to make a dinner and bring it to somebody. And all of a sudden, there's a problem. I just want to uh, go out and make a, a personal visit with somebody and encourage them. And all of a sudden, there's a problem, a problem you didn't anticipate. Sometimes problems arise when we're doing our duty. Now, what are we going to do about it? There's some investigation, by the way, that needs to take place before you do your duty. That's one of the things I think we learn here in verse 36. You know, Paul, I just wondered, did he know, did he investigate, did he look at what might occur if he goes back to Barnabas? And he asked in verse 36, I wonder as we go into this matter, what's going to happen if I ask to take John with me again? If I ask to take John Mark? They're investigating the churches. They're looking. They're going to go through the matter. But if he, as he thought thoroughly about what's going to take place, if he asked Barnabas and he talked about bringing John or Barnabas asked Paul about bringing John, well, let's look at their determination. Verse 37. Barnabas determined to take with them John. Barnabas had an, a rule unbending here. He was going to take John regardless of what Paul said about it. He was determined, and Barnabas determined to take with him John. Some people, dear friends, as the scripture denotes, just don't work well with other people. I want you to look here into the scripture about personal problems. There's an analogy that was given several years ago to describe people who just don't get along. You may have heard it before. It's called the hand and glove test. Sometimes the glove doesn't fit the hand. And we're talking about people. Now, the glove may be in perfect condition, but it just may be the wrong size, maybe the wrong color. Maybe that glove just doesn't fit. Then the hand may be perfect in every way, but they just don't fit together. They just cannot work well with others. Do you know there are people in life who just don't work well with others? In fact, you probably know them at work. There's maybe an individual that, and, and you, you maybe don't want to be asked to, to do anything because you know they just don't work well. Sometimes we don't work well with others. Sometimes perhaps it's due to things uh, out of our hands. Maybe we're just sick. Maybe we've gone through a difficult time. We're just moody. But there are times in our life when people just don't work well with others. In fact, I'm reminded of the kindergarten report card. I can remember that little, you know, section that says works well with others. And you get either a check or a check plus or a minus. I don't know if they still do these kind of report cards in kindergarten. Miss Sharon says they don't. But I was going to school. This was what you got. You, you, you get something like this. And then when you're in kindergarten, you get a check minus or a minus or an S for satisfactory. Y'all remember that? An E for excellent. One of the categories was works well with others. Some people just don't work well with others. Here's an instance where even the Apostle Paul didn't want to work with somebody. In fact, some people get an X in this category. And they just have never worked well with others. They work much better by themselves. In fact, when you put others with them, they just have a tendency to offend people. And so I want us to consider in this determination the inflexibility of Barnabas. He's determined. He's not going to take no for an answer. Dear friends, anytime we get into a position of, we're not talking about a position of doctrine, but of opinion, a personal preference, and we just determine it must be this way. And if it's not this way, you get angry and irritated and you get, get frustrated. You can almost count on it. There's going to be a personal problem. Because inflexibility causes problems. And, and maybe out of our comfort zone, maybe that's not the way I do it, but sometimes that occurs. So personal problems are a result of inflexibility. It must be my way if you want me to stay. I've known a brethren just like this. I, I know because of elders and they've reflected upon this, or maybe someone's come to a preacher and said, if you don't do it this way, I'm going to leave. How sad that a person will be so inflexible. If they don't do it my way, I'm not going to be in service time at this time. It's going to, it's going to be in, in this particular manner. And these problems begin to fester. And so it is the case that in Paul and Barnabas, even the most pious and godly of men, there's an issue that's right on the horizon. 
In James chapter 3, verses 17 through 18, the Bible says, But the wisdom that is from above, heavenly wisdom, is pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. These are qualities that we should all want to describe who we are. I'm an easygoing person. I'm easy to get along with. It doesn't have to be my way. Now, certainly I have a right to have an opinion about it. But, you know, if it's another way, we're not talking about matters of heaven or hell here. And so easy to be full of mercy, good fruit without partiality, without hypocrisy. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We have to make an effort to be peaceful, don't we? We have to make an effort to sow the fruits of peace. So peace isn't an accident. Peace happens because someone has planted the seed of peace. We've tried to make peace. And so we've tried to be flexible. So when someone gets your parking place in the parking lot, this is not a time to be determined. It's not a time to get upset. When someone gets your pew and sits in, this is not a time to be determined, is it? When, when, someone, when someone perhaps takes a, something that you thought was yours or maybe it was yours, it's not time maybe to d- divide lines of faith. And so be flexible perhaps is what God's trying to tell us here. Let's notice the third point, dredging it up. So we notice Barnabas looks like he's being a little rigid here, isn't he? But what about Paul? Verse number 38, Paul thought not good to take with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And so Paul brings up something that John, he didn't like John had done. John, for some reason, had departed in that first missionary trip. He didn't see it through to the end. And we're not told why this occurred. We don't know what kind of issue John Mark had. But we know it must not have been to the issue of parting of faith because Barnabas wants to bring him. Or if it had, he made it right. In fact, in Colossians 3 and 13, there's a passage here that perhaps we need to reflect on. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, also do ye. There's a principle of forgiveness. And and for some reason, Paul's not very forgiving here. He doesn't want to take John. I don't know what John, the Bible doesn't tell us, but we know this. Paul doesn't want him to be on this trip. Is it the case in our life that perhaps someone has disappointed us in the past? Someone has said something to us that was personally offensive. Maybe even worse, they said it to our children because when it happens to our children, we have a tendency never to forget it, especially when they're young. Is it the case that we have allowed this feeling or this thought to continue with us, not for days and months, but for years, maybe generational in families, and never have the attitude of forgiveness, never sowing the fruit of peace, never reflecting upon what James says and being gentle, forgiving one another. If a man have a quarrel against any, as Christ forgave you, forgive them. But we dredge it up. And in fact, we've heard this story so many times that we can recite it. The children can recite it. I remember when brother so-and-so, well, you think you were there. You've heard it so often. I mean, you can repeat it word for word because you've you've heard mom and dad say it forever. Or you've heard brother so-and-so bring this up. And dear friends, contention and problems arise because we keep dredging up the past and we just won't let it go. Paul's going to dredge it up. I'm not judging Paul or Barnabas. And I'm going to make that point here very clear. But I'm just making some application maybe to us today. Perhaps we need to let some things that bygones be bygones. And, 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 and some of these issues, we're not talking about matters of doctrine. We're talking about personal issues when someone has just, just upset us in some way. And so it is dredging up the past needs to be avoided. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Here we're tra- describing life and our focus on life where should our focus be Paul Paul says brethren I count not myself but I've apprehended but this one thing 
So I'd circle that word one. It was my Bible. There's one thing Paul says you got to get. There's one thing I do. You got to forget those things which are behind. Paul says you got to let those things go. Reaching for to those things which are before. He says, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Sometimes you got to let the past go. The past hangs on to people. And sometimes your past keeps you from growing. Your past sometimes keeps you from, from overcoming. And it weighs you down and pulls you down. And Paul says, now listen, I can't do anything about that past. He said, but I can look forward. One thing, I can go forward and I can look forward to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Don't let the past indicate your future. Don't let the bad choices perhaps we've made or those words we've said out of turn allow you to have an ill will or feeling towards somebody else. Let it go. Don't take it with you to bed every night and allow you not to sleep. Let it go. Don't allow it every time you see sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so to give you a sour taste in your mouth. Let it go. Because all we're doing is having disunity among the body of Christ when things like that happen. Look at the fourth point with me, if you will. By the way, that's insensitivity, isn't it? You're just being insensitive. Let's go to the next point. In verse number 39, the scripture says this concerning Paul. And there was a contention, dissension. There was so sharp between them, they wouldn't let it go, that they departed asunder one from another. It divided their fellowship. Do you know there are brethren who actually, because they have personal problems, they can't get along? Have you ever met somebody like this? I was preaching for a little church in near Bastrop, Texas, outside of Austin. I preached there for two years. I noticed that there was one family who sat on the, to the right. There was another family who sat on the left. These were all farming families. They had big cattle ranches. I noticed the twain of the families did not meet. One day after services, one of our black brethren who were attending there came up to me and, he, and we were just talking and he indicated to me there's a rift between these two families. I said, what's the rift over? He said, I don't know. I said, how long has this rift occurred? He says, as long as I've known them, there's been this rift. I said, well, we need to do something about this rift. I'm just a young preacher student. I really didn't know how to handle it. So I went to an older preacher. I said, brother, we've got this rift. I didn't know in the church the twain won't meet. They won't, they won't actually sit on either side. They can't get along. What shall we do about it? He said, we need to meet with them. And so I can remember this still. We met with his family and we tried to figure what it was about. It was about a property dispute that went back two generations over where the fence was located. For two generations, families wouldn't talk. They wouldn't talk to, brethren wouldn't talk to each other, wouldn't work together over a fencing dispute. Now, those of us in Macon County know this to be very real because you live in an area, we live in an area where these things happen. I don't know, I don't know what the particular case may be with you or with somebody else, but in this particular matter, they couldn't even remember where the dispute was, but they just knew they didn't talk. And um, that preacher talked to them for a while. We prayed about it. We talked about what God wants and, and thankfully they came together in unity and they hugged each other and peace was brought to a church Brethren, I tell you, sometimes if we just be a little flexible and realize there are things more important, eternal matters, it's not worth the dissension. It's not worth the contention and sharp division among brethren that was occurring here in verse 39 to the point where they departed from one another. J.W. McGarvey, he's written two commentaries on the book of Acts. He says in one of his the controversy which Luke expresses by the term paroxymos, of which contention is rather a tame rendering. Though paroxymos, which we have derived, would it be expressed to a high degree of passion. So this wasn't just a few words. They were, they were passionately contending with one another. They couldn't get along over this matter. 
James 3, 5 through 6 says, Even so the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. Behold, how great a matter, a little file kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among its members, that it defiles the whole body, it selleth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on the fires of hell. We need to be careful about our tongue, don't we? And things that we say, words that are spoken that can be remembered for a very long time. Brethren, let me be clear about this contention. I'm not going to solve it this morning. I don't know all the, all the, the facts, but I've struggled in my ministry through the years trying to just, you know, who was right? Was it Barnabas? Was he right? And there are times when I thought Barnabas was on the right side. Then there were times when I said, you know, but Paul, how could Paul be wrong? Paul must have been right. Then I think Paul was right. I don't know where you are this morning, but this is the conclusion that I've come to. Were any of them right? Were they both wrong? Were they both wrong in how they were dealing with this situation? Were any of them doing really what they should be doing? Sometimes I have found in personal disputes that everybody's wrong. <laughs> and that there's wrong, there's plenty of wrong to go around on both sides. And when brethren are, are able to, to maybe realize that and acknowledge that, good can come. So the conclusion I'm drawing this morning is perhaps none of them are right. Let's go to our last point in our sermon, the division. The division is in verses 39 and 40. And so and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed one from another. Verse 40, Paul chose Silas and departed being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19, let's be clear. Six sayings, does the Lord hate you? Seven are an abomination to him. Here are the things the Lord hates. I wouldn't want to be in this list because God hates these sayings. A false witness, he that speaketh lies, he that soweth discord among the brethren. God hates division. God hates when brethren divide. Oh, God doesn't want that in his church. In Romans 16, 17, I beseech you now, mark them which cause divisions and offenses. You mark them. You mark those that are dividers in the church. You mark those. What kind of division? Any kind. Maybe this kind was doctrinal kind. They were dividing, causing divisions over false teaching. And you, you learn to avoid them. And so God doesn't like division, and neither should we. We should do everything within our power to keep that from happening. You know, people often ask, you know, about Willette. When you visit other places, when preachers come, how does a church in the middle of nowhere grow to such size? And I believe part of it is because we've been able to the most part to avoid the division. Nothing is more Doesn't mean we haven't had problems. Greatness. Doesn't mean we haven't Until had disputes. You achieve it Doesn't mean that sometimes brethren uh, uh, get rubbed the wrong way. With a smaller but gun. We've been able to rise above it. We've been able to look at the greater good, With the, the greater goal, the preaching of the gospel, the saving of souls. With your brothers, There's nothing your Satan back. loves more than dividing churches. He loves it when brethren are dead last he at loves the very when last get second. Them all. Play on PS4 Pro. Let's have a conclusion this morning to these lessons. In this Welcome particular lesson, we notice there was rigidity. Barnabas was determined. When brethren are rigid, usually problems happen. Then there was remembrance, bringing up things from the past. Both, one from Barnabas, one from Paul, both qualities that cause problems. Then there was a railing because of the rigidity and remembrance. They railed on one another. Then there was a rupture of fellowship. Let us never allow those things to happen among us. Nothing is more beautiful than achieving greatness until you achieve dynamic Do you remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Outnumbered Joseph a smaller was mistreated gun. by his brother. He was sold into slavery and had every right to be angry. He had every right to hold the grudge. With he had every right to be personally upset about how Coming back from dead last at the church. very last Does second. anyone here remember Play the name PS4 of Pro. Joseph's first son? I know you know the Bible name. Welcome to download. Because the Bible to be name, to with Manasseh, but you may wonder. is easy to locate. But do really you know free? what it means? What's the catch? Yeah, almost Let's all of it forget. is free. But there are a few things you need to know. First, you can In check Second out Timothy 4, 11, I believe Paul learned that lesson. Right here on the page. So what's the I'm glad Acts 15 is not the end of the story, aren't you? I can explain over lunch. I'm glad we got Second guy. Timothy 4. Have a seat. Because there was a remedy. Evidently, something changed. I don't know. Part, part some apps Paul, give you the full Maybe some with John free. Mark. I don't know. Maybe he was young and some of the...
suggested not stable. I don't know. But some but apps need to pay to get all the features. Come to the close of his life. Want some chicken, this. some avocado. Only Lucas with me. And, Look at uh, this. I'm gonna need a fork. Take Mark. Free to try Bring him means to try before you buy. For he's probably oh, to me. Salads for days. For ministry. All right. What a wonderful statement forever. by the Most Apostle Paul. Most trial software expires yeah, after 30 days. Yeah, I don't always days. understand and know why these things Oh, come are. on. You but should also know trial versions may us. not get software or security updates. Brother, we need to know our place in that. Strawberry 2? We need to know the Now that you understand free software, click with the Thanks, download lady. I was going to be the way before. This is hard to learn. But when we learn that lesson, we'll be much more peaceful. We've studied church problems. We don't want those problems here, but that's why we study. We're not doing it because we think there's a problem, but we know there's going to be. There has been. And when it comes to those, let's classify them as the practical principle and person. And let's deal with them in a biblical manner. Let's keep the unity of the church. In fact, Paul says endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So we need to endeavor to do that. Because when we do that, dear friends, Satan has no chance against the power of the gospel as being preached here. If we can assist you in some way becoming a Christian, if you're not a Christian, would you obey the gospel? Repent of your sins. Be baptized for the remission of sins. After you confess the name of Christ, if you're a Christian and you've struggled in some way, maybe, maybe you need prayer. That's what we're here for. This church loves you. This church wants to help you. If it's public, bring it before the church. If we can help you at this time, you come as we stand and as we sing.